Those of you, uh, first, let me begin with a few uh, uh, thank yous as well. First of all, thank you to uh, uh, Alexander for the pro on behalf of the program. That is Alexander Mamut, our head of our board of trustees, Varvara Melnikova, the director of the institute, Dennis Lientev, the stroke of KB, uh, Dasha, the, our, the public program director, and, and most certainly to Olga Tanisheva, Nikolai, and, and uh, Masha, with whom we collaborated uh, on this program for the, the course of um, the course of the year. Uh, those of you who uh, weren't here last night, I wanted to rub it in a little of what you missed. Um, we had a, a keynote address from uh, Kolhas, Ram Kolhas, uh, a, a conversation with uh, Ram, uh, John Rabistrik and I, uh, three quite amazing student projects, Shift, Fee, and Erkis, and then really lovely uh, uh, talks from Keller Easterling and, and Daniel Vandervelde. And all of this is, uh, is online. Uh, and you can revisit this at your at your convenience. This evening, uh, our lineup is equally uh, of, of equally uh, of equal interest. I'm going to be beginning doing a uh, another keynote th this uh, to start us off. Some recent uh, musings on uh, machine vision uh, as at urban scale. We'll then see two of our uh, really strong student projects: Patternist and Sever. We'll have a talk then from the artist Julia Aranda. And then the last two of the student projects that we'll share with you the evening, Common Task and DOMA. And then two really special talks from Ben Cervini and uh, leading us out uh, of the showcase, uh, Liam Young. Uh, I'm not going to go into much before the, the keynote address on the sort of the rationale and structure of the program as we did last night. I could, well, however, once more wave the, uh, our little red and blue manifesto book uh, available uh, over here for you as well. I'll also say, lastly, before um, uh, going into my, my own talk, that we, uh, this is the first year of the New Normal program. We will be uh, doing applications in the admissions process all again next year. Please go to the, this, the newnormal.strelka.com uh, for more information uh, for those of you who are interested in being part of this. Uh, for next year. Okay, so the talk that I wanted to, do, to share with you tonight draws a little bit on, on work from the, the stack, the book that I uh, wrote, published with MIT last year. Daniel and, and Vinka from Medhaven did the, the cover for this uh, and also designed the one image in the book uh, of the, the stack, which is a book that's sort of arguably uh, one picture in a 500 page caption. Uh, at their, uh, that we developed. The argument of the book, uh, which I, I, I'm not going to go too, too deeply into, but uh, is, it tries to give an image of a structure of how planetary scale computation works at different scales and layers. The first layer of this is with the Earth layer, uh, where we draw the energy and resources and, and structures from this, the grounding plane upon which planetary scale computation most directly um, ensues. The Earth is also, this layer is also uh, the site of, of interest for uh, computational ecological governance to rationalize, um, these, rationalize these flows. Above this is the cl a cloud layer, which is, includes all of the data centers and cyber infrastructure that links and produces all these weird um, geographies that we are begin only beginning to make sense of. It itself has a tremendously uh, uh, is a huge energy and resource appetite um, that we begin to manage, but also produces, as I say, uh, a number of irregular geographies in its own image. It's, the cloud is anything but placeless. Uh, it just produces territories that are hardest for us to read. One of the maybe uh, more uh, uh, direct things that it does is shift the relationships between states and, and platforms in both directions, that pl cloud platforms begin to take on more of the role of states. States uh, evolve towards cloud platforms. At the city layer, which I'm going to talk a bit more about tonight, um, we have is, is uh, the habitat scale structures that locate the interfaces with which uh, we connect to, the, to those infrastructures. And we need to think of the city not just as a given city, but as a global network of cities. The things that exist in the city layer uh, are, are able to be known to the stack to the extent to which they are addressable. Uh, and as something that can be addressed, it can appear, it can, be, it can send and receive information. 
All of this is made legible to us and to other users by various interfacial systems that provide maps, diagrams, uh, and ways into the system by showing us what is and isn't there, what is and isn't possible. It produces a number of kinds of, then at the top of, the, of, of forms of users. The users is this position in which each of us steps into or out of uh, at, different, at different points in times, but it's available not just to people, but to, uh, but to algorithms and robots and all kinds of other uh, types of species. As far as the stack is concerned, anything that can initiate a uh, chain reaction, if you like, with the interface is good enough of a user uh, as anything else. Uh, the politics of this, uh, uh, sharing this position with so many other creatures uh, begins part of, the, part of the issue. Now, since the book was published, uh, I think some of the issues around the stack as a single model have shifted quite a bit. One of the things that I think we see quite clearly is the development of regional stacks or hemispherical stacks. There's a, there's a North American stack, there's a Chinese stack, there's a Eura Eurasian or Russian stack. And the segmentation and perhaps a kind of forced diversification of this may produce something like a hemispherical, so kinds of Galapagos effects within each of these stacks uh, as well. But as AI, artificial intelligence, grows within each of them, which I'll talk a little bit about as well, they too are in a way bound inside uh, those, those firewalls. Um, and so the, the book that I've been working on more recently tries to deal with this, is dealing with this, this condition, more particularly around artificial intelligence, machine vision, uh, and the links of this sensation, uh, the sensing and sensation, um, and also the point in which uh, our ability to uh, produce uh, 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 narratives around this condition begin to break down, that itself becoming uh, the, new condition, the, the new condition, the new normal. So, to be specific, the, the t what I want to then talk about is that within this model of the stack, um, to drill down specifically to the city layer, within the city layer, to talk about AI, and specifically within AI, to, AI, to talk about this, the, 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 uh, this moment of interest of machine vision, vision being in scare quotes for a reason, so, which I'll get to. Okay, first a bit about AI. I want to first qualify the way in which we're talking about this. Um, from the Turing test on forward, we've had a, a way of seeing AI as being more or less uh, personified, that we al allow the AI to recognize the AI has intelligence if it will perform thinking the way that we think that we think. Uh, this has led us a number of different sort of dead ends, the, some, some of which are also based on the idea that any, we need to interpret or understand any system in terms of it being either an AI system or a human system, that one will replace the other, when in, in reality they are much more hybridized and amalgamated. Should complex AI arrive, it will in fact not be human-like unless we insist that it pretend to be so, uh, because one assumes the idea that intelligence could be real and inhuman at the same time is somehow morally or psychologically impossible. Uh, instead of nurturing this, we would do better to allow that in our universe, thinking, quote unquote, is a much more diverse and even alien uh, phenomenon than our own particular case. That is, the real philosophical lessons of AI uh, will have less to do with mach humans teaching machines how to think than machines demonstrating to humans uh, that thinking is a much broader and fuller uh, uh, range of phenomena that we would have otherwise thought. Now particularly to this issue of sensing. One of the things we're quite interested in is the work in, in evolutionary robotics. Um, evolutionary robotics has been a moment where this, uh, there's a flip in the, the, the epistemology of AI, which I'll talk a bit more from top down to bottom up. Evolutionary robotics works because the little uh, machinic creatures are able to sense the world in a particular way and develop in, in, in their own responses and their own heuristic relationships to the, their own limited little worlds. That is, it's not that they can think and sense, it's that they can think because they can sense. Now, within this, moving a little bit up to the urban scale, um, and, and then specifying now, finally, on this problem of vision, uh, we would first say that vision, broadly defined, has evolved uh, independently many times. Uh, and in the past two decades, it has arguably evolved again. 
this time not for cuttlefish or rattlesnakes, but rather network CCD sensors and algorithmic armatures processing what is sensed into differentiated and motivated recognition. And as I say, it, this has previously happened many times, the independent evolutionary careers of vision, the many times that photoreceptor cells evolved uh, from chemoreceptors, uh, usually well in advance of the development, uh, in many cases, of anything like a brain-like organ. The sensing happens before the thinking. Now, more broadly defined, you could argue that if vision is any sort of, sort of systematic response to photons that you call, allows an organism to respond to its world, then photosynthesis could count as a kind of vision, a chemical response to light. Uh, we could think of it as a kind of vision without images. Now, today we have visual quote-unquote sensors responding to light. Uh, some of them, t they're sometimes shaped like cameras, uh, sometimes and, and sometimes not. Uh, and they mingle with uh, other sensors that are designed to sense other things, motion or pressure or heat or ambient air quality and so forth. So again, to the extent that it's convenient, we call these things machine vision or machine hearing or machine skin, but that correspondence to the mammal uh, sensory system is, is alle allegorical. Uh, with these AI systems, the city is embodying itself in a different way, but not as we do. Now, um, let me skip it. We, we could say then in terms of in our technologization of vision and how we produce, for example, mechanical images that we not only see things but we can record what we see, that this nexus, the, the image making nexus has been primarily human um, and that of all, all the possible species uh, and that's from the beginning of the Holocene uh, to the, the total quantity of images that humans have produced from cave walls to FaceTime, um, measured per year, measured in pounds, measured in total terabytes, however you want to measure, continues to increase exponentially. And now with digital imaging machines in everyone's pockets, with, with, with uh, uh, visual sensors and cameras embedded across the surfaces of the cities, it's certain that the raw sum of images, however you would want to measure it, since the year 2010 uh, is, was more than all of the uh, images that we had produced in the years previous to, to this. There are 500 hours of YouTube video uh, uploaded per minute, uh, and that's just for human and that's just supposedly for human consumption. Uh, most of the images that we that are made are not for humans to see; they're made by machines for other machines to in, in, in interpret it. Um, now, but just because there are many images that are made for no one, no person to observe or interpret, that does not mean that they are functionless, quite the opposite. They are made, as I say, by machines for other machines to, quote, see the world, but they do so differently than we do. They may not have eyeballs and rods and cones and a visual cortex, but they do have sensors that detect light and motion and heat and color in other ways. Today, the industrial scale processing of data that has been gleaned by scanning the light spectrum in some way from street surveillance to the millimeter scale quality control along assembly lines represents a significant fraction of all the work that the world does to image itself for the purposes of governing human society. At the end of the day, the machinic phylum takes more selfies than selves do. The function of representation, which will be the, really the, the crux of my remarks, is rather different. The image, quote unquote, may remain data and is never or need not ever be rendered to look like a picture because this isn't how the machine interprets that data. An algorithm that is programmed to discern a particular pattern uh, or to detect an anomaly can, quote, see it directly in the data itself it does not need that data to be projected as if for a mammal and reseen and reinterpreted back into code. And so, like plants, do machines also possess a kind of vision without images, or at least a kind of image uh, that suggests a very different capacity for abstraction 
uh, to and from its own uh, embodiment, its physical instantiation embodiment in the world um, in this way. Now, it, among the things that these systems see, of course, is us. And seeing ourselves through the eyes of this machinic other uh, that can, does not and cannot have its own affective sense of aesthetics is a kind of is a, a interesting and sometimes weird kind of disenchantment. Seen this way, we are just more stuff in the world for distributed machine cognition to look at and make sense of. We're just surfaces and outlines. Our our own sapience is real and it's unique, but as as we are here made into things to be seen and observed that just happen to be sapient, that doesn't really matter to machine vision. And I think this disenchantment is more more fun, more essential than ju than just like hearing the sound of your voice on a recorded tape, and and thinking this isn't you. I, I think it's the potentially the a clearing away of a more closely guarded illusion. The uncomfortable recognition in the machine's mirror is a kind of reverse uncanny valley. Instead of being creeped out by how slightly inhuman the creature in the image appears, we're creeped out by how unhuman we ourselves look through the creature's eyes. Now, I'll move then up to the, to the back to the city, this question of the surfaces of the city. The urban interfaces that we uh, we, we, in which we, we move are themselves a kind of sensory mechanism. Sometimes they are binary gateways that allow or prohibit emission to a domain, and other times they are reactive skins that sense threshold events by reacting to light and sound and touch, ambient trace elements. And as we meander through the city, they are also our habitat as we dwell within them. And in this commingling of diverse sensors of light and air and sound and chemistry, we draw a landscape of sensing and thinking little species, partially embodied one within another, partially co-embodied with one another, as their various out inputs and outputs are aggregated and modeled and acted upon. The AI, again, is embodied, not in the city, but as the city. Now, to, for us, Homo sapiens, that's us, come equipped with an extraordinary array of built-in sensory faculties, uh, and which can be augmented by further, further by synthetic layers and various ratios, ranging from the sensors and trackers in our phones that we carry about, like mules, to the more intimate media of artificial images and sounds. And situating ourselves in this expanded field, we are both sensors and sensed. But the sensors are dwelling as well. They sense us as their world. We are their habitat as much as they are ours. We are organisms living inside of them just as they are inside of us. So on the one hand, we are a primary uh, actor in this drama, perhaps supervising an orchestra of sensing technologies, each individually capable of functional processing and together together capable of certain forms of intelligence, as like neurons. On the other, we're not only the subject of the scenario, we're also its subject matter. The wider urban landscape of synthetic sensory systems is not only a platform through which we extend and extrapolate our capacities for abstraction, it is also capable of other sorts of abstraction on its own. As part of its intelligence, it looks and registers abstractions about us. So again, it's not just AI in the city or on the city, but the AI co-embodied as the city with a different sort of organism to population, to genome, to niche, to signal morphology at work. It also produces a whole range of other kinds of strange, uh, and the coupling of AI and robotics, that is, uh, produces a whole range of, of interesting pseudo-species that inhabit quite different life worlds of their own, but also interact with ours. Another kind of black box to consider, then, are the dark factories in which manufacturing robots assemble other machines 
in environments that are pitch black for us. This is a high, re not, a, not a black screen, by the way, it's a high resolution image of a dark factory in China uh, in which all the lights are off because the robots that are making the manufacturing in this don't need to see anything, and so we turn the light off. Uh, so in that machine vision may account for a plurality of images generated today, it's landscapes such as these that are arguably a true home for contemporary visual culture, even if they are dark as a cave. In that new technologies of vision have always framed how we interpret a historical archive, we might presume that the predominance of machine vision will shift how it's possible to critique uh, perception. So in short, we should imagine uh, AI urbanism in term, a bit like Van Uxchal's stroll into the field populated by intermingling but mutually oblivious little life worlds, and or in terms of his parable of the tick, the tick laying in wait for some threshold event to come its way, at which point it triggers its programmed response out into the void. Many of our urban sensors and their limited forms of AI work similarly and with similar nobility. More versatile synthetic intelligence occupy more complex umwelt. Some are predator, some are prey, some are in motion, some are flowering, some are pollinating. And as we stroll among them, we may be registered or we may be ignored. We may be a primary cause of concern or, we, or, 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 or just a passing interference in an evolutionary drama in which we're neither protagonist nor target. Now, to AI, um, the question of AI then is not AI in a petri dish, or AI as a kind of synthetic philosopher, but rather AI as, as a landscape scale enterprise for which information sensing and processing exists in complex economic niches. Even or especially uh, because AI evolved in the back and forth between te real technology and philosophical experiments, any AI's epistemic and urban careers cannot, cannot be disentangled from one another other than through very artificial conditions. Now, one of the um, things that I mentioned on the first day in our introduction to the program that we were interested in was messy systems. Uh, we're interested, in, in this way, we're looking at how it, when noise, when a system produces something that appears to us to be noise or, or an accident or glitch, this is where we focus our attention to understand what that system is actually capable of doing. And one of the interesting things we see more recently around uh, machine vision is this capability for apophenia. Apophenia is the a kind of false pattern recognition where you see a pattern that's not actually there, and even if you, you know that there's not actually a face in the faucet, and you tell yourself there's not actually a face in the faucet, you can't help seeing these patterns. Machine vi various machine vision and AI systems um, have a similar kind of, kind of issue. And it's not one that I'm suggesting needs to be solved or, or, or cleansed or washed away. It's in fact, we're in a kind of very interesting moment with this conjunction between machine vision and AI, where it's capable of doing really interesting things on our behalf, but when noise and accident is introduced in the system, it does unexpectedly um, philosophical things on our behalf. The, the word lens in the Google Translate, which I use a lot here in, in Russia, makes all kinds of interesting statements about the relative flat ontology of uh, menu items, for example. Sometimes it'll suggest um, inadvisable uh, things, to, things around you, because it could be quite painful uh, circumstances. So, I, I wanted to then talk a little bit about um, some, uh, speaking of the noise in the system and wh where we might, uh, uh, what this may introduce to us and where the, the more interesting questions may lie. Uh, the, a lot of the more uh, okay, contemporary machine vision systems and their interpretive systems are, are based on multi-layer uh, 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 neural network systems, deep, deep learning systems such as you see on the right. 
where you'll take in a series of inputs, they are, they're calculated and they're programmed uh, and, and understood and sort of structured through different layers. This one is only three. Others that are complex layers may have dozens or thousands. And then pr produce output systems. And this is how machine vision systems are able to interpret what they see uh, and produce images of this as well. Now, oftentimes this works extraordinarily well, like facial, sometimes uh, finding faces. But to demonstrate how different it actually sees the world than we do, um, consider the phenomenon of what are called universal adversarial perturbations, which you can uh, you could discuss at uh, a cocktail party banter. Uh, so wh what is this? What is the universal adversarial perturbation? The image on the left is what to us would appear rather um, unproblematically as a panda. This particular uh, a, net, a neural network has about a 60% confidence that that's a panda. However, if you add this noise filter, the one in the middle, and if you work with Photoshop, it's a simple thing, sort of noise filter, that's in this particular pattern that looks to us like, and there's the equation for this, that looks to us like a random uh, jumble, and you, and you filter the image with it, the one on the, which is what you get on the one on the right. Now to us, this look more or less the same. The one on the right is a little bit fuzzier, but not really much of anything else. But this completely throws off the neural network. It now thinks with 99% confidence that that's a gibbon, which as you know is this big ape. And the interesting thing about the universe, universal adversarial perturbations is that they are in fact universal. These same noise patterns tend to have similar effects on almost any uh, trained network that it was. Here's some other examples of, of, of how this sort of works. So these are images, what I have, the images of things that we would recognize and then um, some of the, th uh, that we would recognize, but then some of the things that it thinks it is. Thinks the dog is wool, thinks that sock is an Indian elephant, thinks the, the, the dog is an Indian elephant, the newts and this as well. And again, this is just because of this one little noise filter. And the point to indicate once more is that, uh, is to, to enter directly into the fact that these systems work. They're able to do things that are maybe functionally equivalent to the way in which we see, but they see the world incredibly differently than we do. And to understand that arrangement becomes our, uh, a challenge both to, um, certainly to our philosophy of, 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 of thought most directly. Another interesting, um, another interesting thing to consider in this are, are, uh, is the fact that the, the, ne the network systems will be trained over time to identify something. So if you've trained a network to identify a strawberry or a, a green snake or a pool table or, or what, what have you, it will, it will be trained and will produce what for it is in essence the, the absolute key image uh, that defines this object that will, and then it will interpret new images in relationship to this sort of core image. The core images that it produces around these things over time, as again, these are being trained, uh, not in a top-down way, but bottom-up, are to us almost unrecognizable. Uh, and yet, it will it'll work in this way. For example, this is an image from the uh, artist Trevor Paglin, uh, who, who's doing a lot of work around uh, in machine vision as well, one of the, perhaps one of the few artists I, who really takes some of this, this work more seriously within the history of, of visual technology. This is a shark, in fact, not only a shark, it's arguably the shark. Uh, what th this is produced by training a network to rec from um, thousands of images to recognize pictures of, to recognize sharks in images. And then you have it produce an image that is all the things in the images that are sharks minus the things in those images that is not shark. And this is what you get, the meta shark. You can also, since you have these multiple layers of the networks working down, maybe 10, maybe 100, and as this, all of this is being processed from bottom to top to bottom, you can stop the system somewhere along the way and ask one of those layers, layer 37, layer 22, that is, that is processing this up and down to output what it's working on and what it sees as this is being moved around. And what you get are things like this, uh, which or what Trevor calls neurots, uh, but we don't really have a sort of a name for them. And the interesting thing is these look nothing like the training data, the inputs, or the output layers. But somewhere between the beginning and the end, it's, 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 it's processing, this, processing this and coming up with these uh, strange things. All right, now, 
I'm going to conclude my talk then um, with some more uh, direct thoughts on the problem of representation within all of this. The, as I had promised, there are three issues around representation that we will want to develop further to begin to make sense of, uh, of, of this predicament. One is how, with the older top-down models of AI, we tried to model our own schema, our own th thoughts about how it is that we would think through a problem, and then program that into the AI, thinking that once it knows our schema, that it could solve the problems like we do. Turns out it doesn't work very well. The second is, as you've seen with these examples from neural networks, the uncertain status of, model, of modes and models within artificial neural networks. Are they representing what they're seeing? Is that representation even the right language to understand what's going on? Are there models there at all? And then lastly, how it is that we could ask that neural network to re-represent back to us what it's seeing and thinking and why that's in fact so uh, and, and why that's in fact so important. So I'll go, I'll go uh, quickly. Um, what I mentioned, the old sort of top-down models, of AI, what, what top-down models of AI from Minsky and the rest through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, what was called good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, worked according to specific logical models that you would represent, you would build logic gates to represent the model of how you think the AI should think through this problem as a logical sequence. Um, and though in, the, in a g general sense, and then it, if it would encounter any particular case, it would know what to do. Now, these systems have some advantages, but mostly they didn't work very well. And recent advances in deep learning AI are based on, as I say, on artificial neural networks that take, uh, that, are, uh, that are much more uh, bottom up in their process. They take, those deep learning systems take inputs and outputs that, and to find re regular features, but do so, as I suggest, without this process of, of representation. Um, now, there'd be some ways in which the top-down models may work. What, what's certain, however, is that regardless of, of how those, our own, how, uh, whether, uh, how, whether our own fundamental models and schema uh, may be to our own cognition, and there's some uh, controversy with this, or whether we actually think through those schemas in the first place. We don't have access to those schema in the ways in which we may think that we do. We don't think the way that we think that we think. And so trying to take the model of how we think that we think and teaching that to the machine is inevitably will um, provide some of this distortion. Um, that is, in the, one way, the, the apparent failure of good old-fashioned AI, the top-down models, the symbolic logic models, is at least partially due to the fact that our own, their own thought images of our own behavior are simply inaccurate. And so we can't teach our models uh, of the, our processes to a machine because our intuitive models of our own thinking may be lovely, but also wrong. And so the fact that it gets it wrong is more our fault. Now, as I said, more recent AI research is influenced by anti-representationalist programs that prioritize the sensory and motor embodiment of the robot or AI in the world over the logical representation. Uh, Rodney Book's 1991 essay, Intelligence Without Representation, marked a key uh, turning point here uh, as well, away from the old Cartesian sort of mental imagery models to ones that were influenced more by uh, Merleau-Ponty in phenomenology. Uh, and so in the rest. Now, let me speak a little bit practically why this matters. If you're, for example, trying to teach a, a, a robot how to drive a car, trying to train a driverless car how to do what driving is. Um, one way to teach a driverless car to drive is to teach it the rules of the road and then outfit it with a sensory apparatus that it needs to gather the inputs and outputs against those rules. Sort of, here's the logical way in which you would deduce driving. But another way is to have it literally watch humans drive and make contextual decisions as they go. The AI in, and it will, this network will then be trained along this way in ways in which we may not even understand. And by this, I would be defining the AI not just as the processor, but the whole sensory apparatus that may see the city with infrared light, LIDAR, can scan in 360 degrees. And unlike a human driver, it, its ultimate outcomes 
of the AI that's capable of navigating its own perceptual world uh, may appear to be functionally equivalent to human driving, uh, and they may surpass it in every way, but what it's actually thinking and doing may be utterly different. So it responds to the inputs and structured outputs in ways, again, that may be completely indecipherable, even to its programmers. They can train it, but they don't have an access to the model of what is going inside, on inside the black box. Partially, again, this has to do with the, fact, the uncertainty as to whether the models are actually, uh, are actually the models the right way of even uh, thinking about this. So the deep learning solution it's described it doesn't rely on this relay of human conceptual models and AI neural models back and forth, um, but is built up layer by layer physically in the pattern carving of the input onto those layers of the, of, of the network, function, uh, network function itself. Um, now, so the, as I w you, another way of sort of putting this is when the neural network is watching the humans drive and it's processing these inputs, is this more like it's a training, but of what kind? Is it a, like training a dog to understand commands about its world? Or is it more like training a rock with cuts to be sharp enough to have arrowhead functionality? If the acquisition and manipulation of technologies led, for us led to the evolutionary path in higher brain functions, that we learned to use technologies and this actually caused our encephalization in higher brain functions, then at what point does AI as tool and AI as user uh, require those, uh, develop those same capacities. Now, the reason this is important, other than because it sort of just upsets a lot of our um, established understandings in the philosophy of, of, of vision, perception, intelligence, and so on, but that's legally fraught as well. It has a lot to do with how you actually govern and model the city. Should a driverless car trained in this way decide one fine day to just stop or do something even more weird. It may do so for reasons that are unknown and perhaps unknowable. Artificial neural networks may, in their own way, form something like models of behavior, but that doesn't mean those models are actually representable to us. The model, but for whom or for what? This does not uh, stop uh, regulatory bodies from demanding that the owners of AI systems be ready to account for and represent the decisions of their machines back to us to produce models of a kind of thinking that may not be model based, uh, similar to the ways in which human employees uh, are auditable. It's not an unreasonable request, but it may be impossible. So. To summarize this, 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 this point, we have then multiple models of representation or absence of representation in play at once. First, there's the model of how the human thinks that a human thinks humans drive a car. There's a model of how a human models this model to teach an AI how to drive a car. There's a model of how a deep learning system is, is trained to drive a car, which may be inscrutable. And then finally, there's a model of that deep learning model that should or may be re-represented back to humans so they would know what's going on in the box and decide on its legality, propriety, or viability. Now, optimistically, these may provide a sort of synoptic image by which our own model of how we think we think is actually trained in turn that we learn from how we think by what, by, by being trained as much by these systems as training them. Um, and by that representation of the deep model learning in some way, that we would see our own model of thought from this outside perspective. Um, but at the level of a whole society, the comprehension and absorption of AI, which is a much more thorny problem than just the technological one, uh, this introduces a whole range of, of, of implications and problems of translation, or more precisely, of abstraction. So, to conclude, um, machine vision is not only then a new way to make images, it's a new way to visualize and conceive AI's own provisional abstractions. We use machine vision not just to see the world in this way, but to actually understand how the AI sees and thinks. 
weaving between the hidden layers, moving further or closer away from the pictorial, we find genuine abstract machines. In response, art tries to articulate a vocabulary of what is and is not at work for us or apart from us, as it always does. And its capacity for abstraction uh, provides it this capacity. So moving with, about, or among machine vision, uh, this provides a point of leverage because it delves directly into the ontogenesis of raw physical sensation folded into mineral intelligence. It measures the shadows as they are burned. Abstraction in this sense is a reduction to, of a condition to a form, the one th which may also represent conditions other than that from which the figure, I the figure is drawn. A last word. If not for the comprehensive disgorging of fossil fuels in the late 19th century, we would not have this Anthropocene. If not for the economic incentive to look below and at the rocks in this way, we may not have been confronted with the utter discontinu discontinuity between social time and planetary time. It's only by this digging in the rocks to find the oil was geolo did geology that from which we learn deep time even become possible. So even if deep time is one of the ways that we learn to de-link social and planetary time, its discovery was made possible by an industry that operated upon a nature uh, based on this conceit that our time and planetary time were somehow bound. So by pursuing this illusion that, uh, that our time, social time and planetary time were bound, we actually discovered that they were delinked. But in that the Anthropocene puts the planetary time on the time of us, uh, through our social time and our, our economic time, relinking them together, uh, an interesting and ironic outcome ensues. By pursuing the illusion as if it were true, we discovered as a byproduct that it was false. But the byproduct of doing so was that we made it true. So what else do we know? What else are we good for? If, as in Stanislaw Lem's Solaris, the surface, and Tarkovsky, of course, the surface of the planet's ocean was sentient, Earth's strategy towards sentience includes layers of ne layered networks of neurons in the folded gray matter of animal brains, particularly but not exclusively the cerebral cortex of primates, namely humans. We are, as Nikolai Fyodorov wrote a century ago, the medium through which the planet thinks. By having folded some of its matter into the shape of brains and waiting a few million years for those blobs to sort it out, one of the things the Earth very recently learned was its own age. Earth is 4.6 billion years old. A confident figure for this age came as late as 1953, the year that Samuel Beckett premiered Waiting for Godot. We are, we, the Earth's digestive residue, were able to discover and know the planet's own duration. This is a quite impressive uh, thing uh, for a planet to do. But was the project in which the Earth formulated from itself a biochemical intensity, that is us, that would prove capable of knowing how old it is, worth the cost. A Faustian bargain to top all. Was discovering this fundamental truth worth exhuming hundreds of millions of years of pre-Mesozoic biomatter for a two-century fuel supply and the inauguration of mass extinction. I asked our students if they, they thought it was worth it. They were split. Uh, but maybe the better question would have been, what would make it worth it? Must the accomplishment of a Copernican epistemic disenchantment destroy, must it destroy or at least threaten that which it knows? 
Is this a necessary outcome? Or is it only a provisional, is it only a provisional damage that will make, in time, a more durable relationship between knower and known? Thank you.